My name is Bob Labry. I'm representing the Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, <clears throat> which has been putting on a series of workshops and <clears throat> conferences on nature's solutions to environmental problems since 2013. Um, this is this mini conference series began in, in September, and rather in June. Nature's Solutions as National Policy is the overall title. And today we are talking about how animals shape ecosystems. So this is the second installment of the series. And the series intent is to explore how we can leverage nature's solutions to shape policy on climate action and resilience. Uh, in June, we had two soil and food production experts in Australia and India, and a US Congresswoman woman who is also an organic farmer discussing strategies for regenerating a damaged planet while at the same time providing sustainable food sources. <clears throat> Today, our second installment shifts focus from soil to the animals living on the soil and their, and their role in shaping ecosystems and supporting healthy functioning carbon, water, nutrient, and energy cycles. Humans exert considerable effort to control domestic animals and wild animals for the betterment of humans. What are the consequences of these controls? How do animals interact with and actually co-create the habitats they share with humans? Today, wild animals and wildness meet domestic animals and cultivated nature. <clears throat> I just wanna tell you that the, the next uh, event in this series on Nature's Solutions as National Policy is on November 20th. <clears throat> Put it in your calendar now. You'll get a specific invitation. Um, this is focused on the COP26 climate meetings in Glasgow, the UN meetings on climate change. <clears throat> it's going to be an event headed by Joseph Michael Hunt, and will the focus will be on reporting on and critiquing what happened in that climate meeting. So this is the procedure. It's the one we use for this whole series. Uh, each of the speakers will be given a designated time of approximately 20 minutes. And that will be followed by approximately 10 minutes of conversation among the speakers. The idea is to have to generate the conversation as we go. So that 90 minutes later, as of around 11.30, we can open it up to you, the participants. Please, as you go, put questions and comments in the chat line at the bottom of your page. I assume everybody knows how to do that. <clears throat> we will also be adding to that chat line other links and information that may be of use to people, a lot of it coming from former events by Biodiversity for Livable Climate um, and from our various publications, the compendium of resources, for example, that has been coming out since 2014. Um, and one last thing I wanna say is that we would really appreciate if you would be willing to take a few minutes after or during this to fill out a questionnaire um, just about this event and what you had your thoughts about it. It's a very brief one, it would not take very long. We will email this to you as a registrant afterwards, but if you're interested, that link is already in the chat and I will repeat this invitation at the end. <clears throat> so let me move on to our first speaker today. Um, I'll just give a very brief biography, just so you know who he is. And um, the rest of his much longer bio biography and links to his organizations that he's associated with can be found in the announcement that was sent to you to invite you to this. Carl Safina is a professor for nature and humanity at Stony Brook University and founder of the not-for-profit Safina Center. He began his career studying seabirds and went on to work for years to reform US fishing policy. His numerous writings on the environment include Song for the Blue Ocean, Blue Ocean and Becoming Wild, How Animal Cultures Raise Families, Create Beauty and Achieve Peace. He may be best known to the public as host of the PBS series, Saving the Ocean. 
Carl, welcome. You're muted, Carl. All right, great. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Wonderful to be with everybody and with, with really such great, great speakers. I'm gonna just dive right into my talk. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is based on my two most recent books. One is about what animals think and feel and the other is about culture among uh, animals. A and all of, you know, animals includes humans, but it also includes a lot of other things. So let's, uh, let's get going here with this. Many of us have wondered, does my dog really love me or does she just want a treat? And it's kind of easy to see just by looking at them that yes, of course, our dogs really love us and this should be all we need to know, right? And uh, just by looking at them, we can always tell what's going on in their fuzzy little heads, except that sometimes we're not really sure what's going on in their fuzzy little heads. And just looking at them is not really enough to know. But something's going on there. I think it's, uh, it's very clear that the idea that nothing is happening inside the heads of all these other creatures is not a viable idea. There is something going on and we would like to know what it is. The thing is, if we ask, do they love us? That is not a question about them. That is a question about us and our human insecurity. It's always about us, right? So even when we think about them, we say, do they love us? And that's really a question about us. I needed a different question. And my question became, who are you? Who are you is a very different question. That is a question about them. And that can help us get started. We know that there are qualities and capacities of human minds. So the question becomes, are these capacities of only human minds? What is happening in all of the other brains that share the planet with us? Is it really possible that there's no way in as we have often been told? No, actually that is not true. There are some very good ways in. We can look at brains, we can consider the fundamental principle of all of biology and we can watch what they do. It turns out that a nerve cell is a nerve cell, regardless of where it is in the animal kingdom. A nerve cell of a jellyfish is basically the same thing as a nerve cell of a chimpanzee or a human or a dog or a frog. And nerve cells do different things during the course of evolution. So if we just look at mammal brains, we see a simplified mammal brain on the left. Uh, a, a more elaborated mammal brain that, that is in um, most of our heads. And this is the way evolution works. It takes what's in stock off the shelf. It doesn't invent a new thing. It just makes a little bit of a twist and comes up with uh, a, a little bit of a variation. So you see that our brain and the brain of a chimpanzee is very, very similar. Ours is bigger, which is good because we're more insecure, but there's a dolphin and an even more elaborated mammalian brain and a bigger one. This may have implications, <clears throat> but that doesn't show us the mind. So how do we get some inkling about what's going on in the mind? Well, we can watch what they do. For instance, these elephants, have made a decision that makes perfect sense to us because it's a very sensible decision. They have found a patch of shade in an otherwise very hot and sunny place. And in that patch of shade, they've let their babies go to sleep. But the larger ones do not themselves go to sleep. They remain somewhat vigilant, dozing, but facing outward and touching because the world is a dangerous place. We understand that because on those same planes, under the same sun, listening to the same whoops and roars of dangerous potential predators, we became who we are and they became who they are. And we've been neighbors for a very long time. The imperatives among all of us are essentially the same, which is find enough food, try to stay alive, dodge the dangers, keep your babies alive. That is the general arc of life. And it's what we all have to do, what we are geared to do. 
And even if our outer contours are different, under the skin, we are all kin. The skeletons of whales and elephants and human beings are essentially exactly the same. They just are shaped a little bit differently. We all have the same bones. Even in the flipper bones of whales, there are the same five fingers that are in our hands, the exact same bones. We have the same organs. We have the same neurotransmitting chemicals that create mood and motivation. So we see things that we recognize. We see that the young are curious as they are learning the world, for instance. We see the deep bonds of family affection. We see the ecstasies of courtship. And these are things that we all share. We all enjoy a little bit of fun and games every now and then. So if my pup comes over to me and rolls over on her back, she has had a thought and that thought is about a feeling. Now, she does not go over to the dining room table and roll over on her back or go to a chair and roll over on her back. She comes to me. She comes to me because she knows that we are family. She knows that if she rolls over on her back, I will understand her thought and her question. The question is, will you rub my belly? And the reason she's had that thought is she knows from experience that it feels good and that I know how to do that. And she trusts me 150% because we are family together. So she's had a thought. She's had a thought about a feeling. She's going to feel good. And in a way, it's not too much more complicated than that. If you like it more complicated, there's a lot of science to back all of this up, more science all the time. People have put dogs through MRIs, they've looked at their brain waves when they show them pictures of people they know and strangers, they see that they light up differently when they recognize people that they know and that they uh, love and share life with. We can now watch rats dreaming. It did not surprise me at all that rats dream. We, we can often see our dogs dreaming when they're asleep on the rug. You say, wow, I wonder if they're dreaming. Well, yeah, they, they are dreaming. But recently, a study came out saying that cuttlefish dream. And I have to say that that surprised me. Now, let's talk a little bit about culture. We all know that there's a lot of culture. Every human society is cultural. And we say, well, culture is things like music and art and, and stuff like that. But that is not what culture is. We never really ask what is culture and why is there culture? We only point to the products of culture and think that that is culture, right? So music, we say music is culture. Well, music is a cultural product. All human societies have culture. They have a lot of culture. And yet, despite great differences in culture, we can see the basic humanity in everyone. So why don't we all have the same culture? Why does culture vary? Because what culture is, is culture is the answers to the question, how do we live here where we live? That's what culture is. And what does culture do? Well, first of all, culture flows socially. It's a learned thing that flows socially. It tells us who we are. It tells us who we're with and it tells us how we live. That's what culture is, and that's why culture exists. We learn culture mostly from our mothers at first, and then we get it from parents, other elders, and social groups. Now, the thing is, we can all learn any culture. We could be born into any culture. We could learn it. We could grow up that way. But once we know that, we know a way of doing things, or a few ways of doing things, and we are not interchangeable. At first, before we learn our culture, we are interchangeable, and then we are not anymore because we've learned the answers to the question of how do we live here. So if you grow up in the Amazon, you know how to make a living in the Amazon. You know what the food is, you know how to hunt there, you know what the dangers are. If you grow up in the Arctic, you know how to hunt there, you know how to withstand a dark winter that lasts for months. And that's okay. And we could all learn to do that if we grew up there. But if you take somebody from the Arctic and drop them into the Amazon, they will die. If you take them from the Amazon and drop them in the Arctic, they will die. 
that is the fundamental importance of culture. It's not just a superficial thing. It tells us how we survive where we are. Culture is not just a human thing. There are many other animals, not all, but many other animals that are cultural and they learn their culture at first from their mother in often a very long process that lasts for years, just as it lasts for years in human beings. Chimpanzees, for instance, if they were raised uh, among humans and then just dropped in chimpanzee habitat, they would simply die. They have to learn everything about the uh, physical habitat as well as the social environment. How do you interact with others? How do you defer to others that are higher ranking? What does it mean to be higher ranking or lower ranking? Um, what are the vocalizations that signal? What are the physical things that signal to others? Um, how, do, how do we find food? What is food? Where are the food trees? How do we hunt? All of those things must be learned by chimps. What, what do chimps need to learn about being chimps? Basically, they need to learn everything. There's culture in other animals as well, even other animals that are pretty different from us or chimpanzees. Sperm whales have culture. In fact, they have a social organization very much like elephants and female-led families. And yet when you spend time with them, they're remarkably mammalian. They love to greet each other when they come together. They love to touch and rub. You suddenly, you know, you see a sperm whale, it's a very odd looking kind of a creature. And then you suddenly realize, wow, they're doing a lot of things that are just like a lot of mammals do. We tend when we see animals to just see animals and label them with the species. So we say, well, here are some chimpanzees, but that's not how they see it. They see each other as individuals and those individuals have histories and often they have social dynamics. For instance, Hawa there is the most dominant member of his group. And uh, he's what you call the alpha male. Um, Musa was a contestant for that position. He lost. So Hawa and Musa keep a tight eye on each other. They are what we would call frenemies in human society. They cannot afford to be together and they cannot afford to be very far from one another. Simon in the back there is an up and coming potential contender. So they're all keeping a close eye on each other. That's the dynamic. You see a bunch of animals you say, well, these are all chimpanzees, but these are all individuals. If you look at them for just a few moments, you see they look as individual as humans do and they have very individual histories that are very different. Um, also, all chimpanzees are born with a pale face that almost always darkens when they get old, turns black. Masariki there is one of the individuals whose face is not darkening. He will always have a pale face. So chimpanzees have solved one problem that humans cannot seem to solve, which is they know that what color your face is makes no difference. Often we talk about biodiversity and we think of it uh, on three levels that have to do with genetic diversity. We think of biodiversity as strictly a genetic thing. That unfortunately does not cover it because culture is the overlooked fourth dimension of biodiversity. If all the animals in, in a, a species die out in one region, then the answer to how you live in that region may be lost and regaining it means reinventing it and that takes a long time. So just for instance, here is a thick-billed parrot. Now often uh, there oops sorry there are there are a few good examples of how culture and um, the attempt to reintroduce a species that has disappeared from a region, uh, those two things often collide not in a happy way. So for instance, the thick-billed parrot once lived in the Southwest United States. When it was extirpated from the Southwest United States, conservationists bred a bunch of them in captivity. They brought them back to where they used to live. They opened the cages and they all died because the culture of how thick-billed parrots live there was lost. They did not know what to do. They didn't know where the food was, where you go at night, how you cope with changes in the weather, who was dangerous there, they didn't know it. 
There are a bunch of stories like that with different species. Um, they don't know the migration routes, for instance. You, you put bighorn sheep back someplace in the Rockies. They don't know where to go in the winter and they die at very, very high rates. Uh, if there were a few left and you augmented the population, the new ones would just follow the old ones and they would learn the culture. Orcas or killer whales are among the most cultural of animals. And in fact, there are some that are um, only fish eaters. They do not eat mammals at all. And there are others that live in the same region that never eat fish, they only eat mammals and they do not mingle, partly because they would screw each other up. Hunting fish is a different set of skills from hunting mammals. Um, and uh, if you tried to mingle, you would probably never catch anything. So this is what culture often does. It does it to people also. It brings individuals together into cultural groups. Cultural groups tend to then avoid groups of other culture. This can help groups specialize and specialist groups can begin to evolve differently because they don't mingle anymore with other kinds of specialist groups. In fact, with the orca whales, they have not interbred, the fish eaters and the mammal eaters of the West Coast have not interbred for about 300,000 years. In effect, they are evolving into separate species in the same region, sheerly because of cultural selection. Let's talk about killer whales for a moment. They eat seals in uh, some places, many places. So, so they eat seals. Why do they not eat people? Why can we trust them around our toddlers? Why don't they hold a grudge? The things that make us human are not the things we tell ourselves are the things that make us human. Every aspect of human behavior, we can see at least some inkling of in at least some other species. And certainly our emotionality, our bonds, and what we call love is not just a human thing. And we're not the ones who invented it. We can see deep devotion in many other kinds of animals, like some of my favorite birds here, the albatrosses. Albatrosses, when they um, are caring for their chicks, they often leave for two or three weeks at a time. They will fly sometimes six or 8,000 miles just to bring back one gigantic meal for a chick that is waiting for them. They breed in the most remote places in the world. Those albatrosses are on Laysan Island, right there, equidistant from any continent in the middle of the ocean. We never think of them, but they know all about us. We are all over their stuff. When they fly six to 8,000 miles for weeks at a time, what they come back with to feed their chicks is full of plastic nowadays. All the chicks have plastic in them. It doesn't always kill them. It's never good for them. And sometimes it does kill them. This one was six months old, was ready to fly, and was packed with red cigarette lighters. Red cigarette lighters. Now, this is not the relationship we're supposed to have with the rest of life on Earth, but it's the relationship we really do have because we named ourselves after our supposedly big brains and our wisdom, Homo sapiens, and yet we do not think of the consequences of our actions. Despite the fact that we don't think about that, we tend to paint animals on nursery walls because when we expect new human life, we have this sort of unconscious blessing. We don't paint work cubicles, we don't paint laptop computers, we paint animals. And that's because our blessing for our unborn children is welcome to this beautiful world. We're not alone here, we have company. And yet, Every one of those animals and every painting you'll see of Noah's Ark, the animals that are deemed worthy of salvation by the creator, all of those animals are endangered now. And the flood that's coming for them is us. We are the flood.
We talked a little bit about evolution. This is the evolution story that we are creating. We cannot let this go this way. This is the story we've long told ourselves that we're the only thing that matter and we're at the top of everything. This is the real picture. Everything else that is here has made the whole journey along with us to be here today. We're one of the more recent ones to join that journey. If we try to think about the whole sweep of life on earth, it overwhelms our little human minds. It's mind boggling. We can't quite understand who we are and where we are. We're almost completely incapable of really having a perspective on ourselves and our life and our time. This is one of my favorite birds, the peregrine falcon. In 1970, they were considered doomed to extinction. People thought there was no way out for them, mostly because of pesticides. But a few people did not take that lying down. That is actually me. I worked on the first reintroduction of captive bred peregrine falcons after DDT was banned. It worked. Bald eagles were almost completely extinct in the lower 48 United States. It worked. Ospreys, when I was a teenager, ospreys were gone from my region, none left. It worked. When people refuse to accept extinction, we can let them know what they know how to do, which is to survive. Humpback whales, one of the first whales that was almost driven completely extinct by the whaling uh, era, which peaked, by the way, in the 1960s, not in the Herman Melville Moby Dick times. Humpback whales are now so abundant, they've recovered so well that you can take selfies with them. So we started the talk by asking, do they love us? And now we're gonna invert that question. We're going to ask whether we have the mental and emotional capacities to simply let life continue to exist and coexist with us on this only living planet. Thank you very much, everybody. Robert, you are muted. Thank you very much, Carl. That's, uh, I need a moment to recover from all those, those thoughts and images. Um, this is our moment to be able to have any interaction and questions among any speakers. Does, does uh, Tanya or Fred, do you have any, any thoughts you wanna raise or a question you wanna ask Carl? I think the beautiful presentation, Carl, I uh, just moved by everything that you had to say. I couldn't agree more with everything you had to say. Uh, I, I really, <clears throat> Many thoughts came to mind related to what we've done with agricultural systems and how we've blown culture and all those things off. And uh, I'll mention some of that as I go along in my presentation, but I think just wonderful, uh, wonderful presentation is my, my feelings on all of it. You, you nail it. When you, when you talk about how the, the value of culture, in my career, I saw very little thought given to culture, whether it was in domestic animals or wild animals. And as we went along in our work, just over and over and over again, watching how cultures evolve, how off the wall kind of things 
that are very important for survival become a part of culture, all these innovations that occur. Um, I think you spoke to that very nicely, and I don't think you can overstate how critical that is, not only for wild animals, but for domestic animals as well, and how we've totally not been paying attention to any of that. So wonderful presentation. Tanya, any thoughts? I agree, it was wonderful. I, I like that we talked about culture because as Fred says, this is not something that we tend to associate with other species. We really do think this is a human thing. And although we have evidence that it is clear, um, we talk about elephants a lot, whales a lot, but this goes down to animals much smaller than those, right? Those are just the biggest ones that we tend to see more. And so maybe we pay more attention to. I do have one question for Carl, just to get your perspective. What do you say to people that, because when you talk about these things, they may say, oh, don't put human traits onto other species, right? You're just, you don't know if that's for sure. You're anthropomorphizing. anthropomorphizing. Um, what do you say to people to that? Because I do think it, we tend to separate science from emotion and from everything else that we say makes us human. And so the way I see it is that it's not putting human traits onto other species. It's just trying to interpret what they're doing as much as we can in our, in our limited knowledge. But yes, I wanted to get your perspective on that. Well, Tanya, you are exactly right. Um, there is still a lot of that. But the thing is, I don't feel like I project human thoughts and emotions onto other animals. I think that I observe what other animals are doing. We can tell something about what they're thinking and the logic of their behaviors. And um, I think that the, the worst mistake is to deny that in the whole sweep of evolution, we somehow suddenly wound up with the ability to have mental and emotional experiences when many other animals have essentially identical nervous systems with the same neurotransmitting chemicals that we know create our mood and motivation. To deny that they have any effect in all the other animals that possess all of these things is totally unscientific, completely illogical, and only goes to feed um, our own, to, and reinforce our own ignorant insistence that we are the only ones on the planet that could possibly matter, which is not at all a scientific conclusion. It's a philosophical conclusion or a religious conclusion. It's, 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 uh, it's certainly not a scientific conclusion. So, you know, I ask what, what is the worst mistake to deny, uh, to, to, to think that other animals have thoughts and emotions or, or to make a rule that denies the possibility that they might. In science, you're not supposed to have rules. You're supposed to go with the understandings that the information and the logic uh, give you. Information plus logic is, is my idea of science. Rules about what you're not allowed to believe is not my idea of science. Carl, I wanted this is just to follow this up very briefly. Uh, a very striking statement. Um, culture is the answer to the question, how do we live here? Now, aim that on humans' awareness of environmental danger and environmental impact. Um, uh, how does, can you talk about our difficulty with understanding our environmental impact? as a, a cultural issue um, that yeah. may be in part uh, what we've inherited. In other words, the herding tendencies, the family tendencies, the, the inner group learning and so on. Um, how do we live here? That's a great question. And how does that, how do we, how do we use that knowledge to deal with environmentalism itself? Well, we, we are almost entirely Westerners and um, most of the world is now almost entirely westernized. So it's a little bit hard for us to get a signal, a really pure signal from other cultures. But if you think about the four or so, let's say 
four large realms of um, human perspective on our human relationship with the rest of the natural world. And those realms would be indigenous peoples who are really, really tied to a land base as hunter gatherers, South Asians, and all of their religious and philosophical beliefs about the, um, uh, you know, this, this, the spiritual interaction between humans and the rest of nature. For instance, uh, the wheels of karma, the, the idea that um, living things are all reincarnated, uh, that uh, one species in one life may become a, a different species in the next life. The idea that the spiritual and the material are constantly interacting. You have the East Asians who did not focus so much on spirit, but more if you look at Confucianism, for instance, more on how does the cosmos work, an observation that there are necessary opposites that form a, uni a unity. Um, the, 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 the unity in diversity, which evolutionarily, you know, biologists think of it um, that way, but, but in science, the unity in diversity is a new thing. Before Darwin, it wasn't thought that there was unity in diversity, but the Confucianists were, were seeing that um, in their view of yin and yang, the necessary opposites. You can't have light unless you have dark. You can't have up unless you have down, trying to figure out the cosmos and deciding that the human role was to try to maintain balances and harmonies. And then you have the fourth thing, which is the West. In the West, there was a split of the cosmos that started with Plato, who thought that everything we see in the material world is a faulty reflection of some pure and perfect existence elsewhere. So that a brown dog to Plato was a faulty reflection of dogness and brownness that existed in some perfect realm somewhere else. This split between the material world and the perfect spiritual existence that was somewhere got swept into the Abrahamic tradition uh, our science developed with a very strong Catholic presence and a Catholic pressure on it. And um, this results partly in the fact that scientists are not only supposed to be objective, but they're supposed to actually have no emotions about what they're looking into and what they're studying, which is a religious point of view, not a scientific point of view. Well, so. Well what, what does culture have to do with our values? Absolutely everything. And that's why in the West, we've treated the world the way we have, because we've learned for thousands of years that the world does not matter, that only the immaterial perfect existence somewhere else is what matters. We've, we've made that our religion. This does not exist in the other three main realms of human thought, although the West has now overtaken most of those other regions as we've sort of, uh, first of all, waged uh, uh, an incredibly vicious and violent campaign of colonialism and then swept the whole world into a competitive monetary system that has globalized. So that's my long answer to your question and the well, subject of the book that I'm working on. Well, you know, and I see Fred nodding his head. <laughs> Um, so let's continue with this. Um, this is the, the, the discussion has begun. Um, Fred Provenza is Professor Emeritus of Behavioral Ecology at Utah State University. And for 35 years, he directed a research group on the linkages between foraging behavior, soil, plants, herbivores, and humans. Behave is the name of an international network he co-founded consisting of scientists, ranchers, farmers, and land managers committed to integrating behavioral principles with local knowledge. His 2018 book is entitled Nourishment, What Animals Can Teach Us About Rediscovering Our Nutritional Wisdom. Welcome, Fred. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you folks. Um, let me get the...
the slides up here. And so what, what I see myself doing is really building, Carl, on, on much of what you said, but linking it with, with domestic animals, which we may not see as having much culture at all. I'm talking about not only how animals shape ecosystems, but how ecosystems shape animals. Um, 50 years ago now, I was working on a ranch in Colorado. I didn't grow up on one. I had the fortune to be out there on one for seven years. I was also a student uh, studying wildlife biology at Colorado State University. In those days, I would have never seen those two worlds coming together, the ranching agricultural kind of world and the wildlife biology ecology world. But during my career, I've seen that happen. And I this think it's show. very encouraging with regard to the things that well, you were well, talking just, about. Uh, just clicking on the signed agreements button. John, could you please, could you please mute? So let me tell a couple of stories to start this off. Um, this is a picture in the, of the ranch that I worked on for seven years. The mountains there in the one picture are Mount Chavanaugh, where we used to run cattle. And uh, we would run them seasonally during the late spring, summer, and fall. And there are some very interesting things that I observed back in those days. We would move them across vast areas and the cattle didn't live in one big herd. They, they dispersed into tiny little groups. And we, through our knowledge of the mountain and the landscape and the animals, understood where we would need to go to find those animals. And the rancher that I worked with, I observed, never bought replacement heifers. That is, he never bought animals from outside his herd and brought them into the landscape. And one time after I took a class in genetics at Colorado State, I was asking him, I was learning about heterosis, and I asked him, I said, why don't you do that? And he sat down and he talked for an hour and he told me stories of his experience. His experience came not from books, but his experience came to his brain through his hands, through a lifetime of observation. And he told me of experiences when he had done that, when he had bought animals and brought them into the area. And he concluded, by saying the animals just don't know the range. And when I think of a lot of the work we did over the years, it all has to do with what does it mean to know the range? Here's another story. We were working years ago with cattle and we were looking at poor quality forages, feeding those during the winter time as a way really to reduce the cost of feeding. That's one of the most expensive things that ranchers do. And so we had this study, the cows were five years old, the diet was primarily ammoniated straw. We fed it from December through May and we ran the study for three years. It was a long-term study. Right off the bat, we noticed that half of the cows were performing very well. The other half of the cows weren't performing well at all. Why would that be the case that we have such a division from a group of animals of the same genetics and so forth, seemingly identical in their, uh, in their genetics? The last story that I want to tell comes from this book, The Buffalo Harvest. And in this book, um, Frank Meyer asks, do you remember reading about buffalo herds, millions strong, moving in a solid mass, stopping trains and wagons? Of course, the herd, this vast mass of animals, would be under the leadership of a grand old buffalo bull who would trot serenely at its head, issuing orders, demanding instant and complete obedience. Isn't that about the picture as you have it in, in your mind? goes on to say, if it is, get it out of there fast, because the fact is that no buffalo herd I saw numbered over 200 animals, and most of them were very much smaller. Most of the herds would run from three to 60 animals, with an average of around 15. In these small groups, the buffalo traveled and fed, scattered over the plains, but each one separate and apart from the other herds. When they stampeded, they did come together and charged as one vast solid herd. But when the fright had passed, they'd separate into their peculiar small herd formation. Do keep these herds in mind, he says. They were important to us in our hunting. In fact, they formed the basis of our attack. Let me tell you how. So that's the question. What was the secret of the bison hunter's success? A last story for you it comes from a workshop I participated in probably 25 years, 30 years ago now at Colorado State University. It was on bioenergetics and nutrition of wild ungulates. 
And there was a group from Norway that came and they were explaining that most of the her moose in Norway migrate from higher elevations in the summer down to the seashores in the winter. It's a much better place to winter. But there were some herds that they were studying intently that didn't do that. They stayed at the higher elevations all year round. Now, the ones that stayed at the higher elevations uh, weren't quite as productive. The number of calves that they had per cow and the size of the calves was a bit smaller, but yet they, they were surviving. So the question was, there's no physical barrier. There's no reason why these moose can't migrate to lower elevations. Why, why didn't they do that? So Bob, you mentioned behave and uh, behave is, was active during the decade of 2000, during a 10 year period. We worked with people on five continents and the idea was it was dedicated to integrating understanding of behavioral principles and processes with local knowledge, the accent on local knowledge of peoples to enhance social, economic, and environmental values of communities and all the animals' life in that community. So what, I mentioned that because I want to give you three examples of, of work that we did. I'm going to focus on the Western U.S. as opposed to some of the international work, but we did many projects around the globe. And I want to start with this notion of herbivore culture and what does it mean for creatures to be locally evolving with the landscapes they inhabit? Um, I see mother, as Carl was saying, she links offspring with ancestors and landscape. She's absolutely vitally important. That's the reason that natal experiences affect food and habitat preferences in broad ranges of taxa, everything from earthworms to birds to insects to fishes and mammals. I'd love to stop here and tell many stories about the bluebirds, but I'll let it go for the sake of time. Um, the same thing we found over our 40 years of work with livestock. A mother has a lifelong influence. Her influence begins in the womb, actually. The fetal taste system is fully functional during the last trimester of gestation. So young animals are already starting to learn about what's food in the environment. After birth, flavors of foods get into mother's milk and they become further cues. And then beyond that, when young animals start to forage, mother becomes a very important model of what and what not to eat. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples of the power of this. Um, we were involved in, in uh, studies, as I mentioned, of how to reduce the cost of feeding livestock. And one of the most important things is, is winter. Winter is where the costs are in the Western United States. And so this idea of can animals forage out like wildlife species uh, was, was important to us. So we did studies where we exposed cat mothers were eating poor quality forages like they would mature forages during the winter. And we uh, had cows that were pregnant. And then we looked at their calves compared to calves of mothers that were foraging on higher quality diets that were being fed to them. And what we found was that calves exposed to mature forages in utero eat more and they digest those forages better and they grow faster than calves not exposed to mature forages. That is to say they're becoming locally adapted to the environments that they inhabit. The food for thought that I gave related to those cows, um, why were half of the cows performing very well when they were fed ammoniated straw and the other half not? The reason was that half of the cows were exposed as calves to ammoniated straw with their mothers. The other half of the cows had never seen that. Now, this is five years later. This is really key to realize. Even after five years without eating straw by either group, groups exposed early in life had higher body weight and condition throughout all three years of that study. They produced more milk. They had shorter postpartum intervals when straw was fed as the bulk of the diet. So it just simply illustrates reinforces, Carl, the points that you were making, the profound influence of these experiences early in life as a part of a group and a culture. Um, we went to, we did many studies with sheep and cattle, both looking at habitat selection preferences. And we did what are referred to as cross-fostering studies. Here's one where we <clears throat> went in and identified animals that lived in the Maxfield drainage. That was their home. Another set of cattle that lived in the Thompson drainage. That was their, their home. And this was within the same herd of animals. 
what we did then was at birth to foster tops and calves onto Maxfield, moms and vice versa. And then we simply looked over the next uh, four years at where do the calves go? And again, the influence on where they go is profound, where they went, where their foster mother, where they had learned to go from their, their foster mother throughout all three years of that, of that study. Um, so why do moose in Norway winter at higher elevations? What, what the, the authors told us, what the, the scientists told us was that they were looking in the archeological evidence and the moose that learned to live at higher elevations were pit trapped several thousand years previously as they migrated, as they attempted to migrate to the seashore. So they learned to stay at higher elevations. They're no longer being pit trapped. What's keeping that in place? It's simply a part of the culture. And I'm sure if we were to look at what I'm going to talk about here in a minute at how organ systems, um, how form, function, and behavior would be quite different now in the moose that live at higher elevations versus the moose that live uh, that winter at the seashore. So we know now uh, through studies we and many people have done that environments influence gene expression, which influences form, function, and behavior. And so <clears throat> that upper slide, enhanced neural response to familiar olfactory cues, the one that's lit in the orange and red is familiar with, with the, the food that it's sniffing, the other isn't. So you see a difference in neural response. Animals, I was talking about the animals that we were wintering out on poor quality forages. They change form and function as well. As one example, there's enhanced rumen volume for animals reared on poor quality forages. That adaptation allows them to eat more poor quality forage, put it in that fermentation vat and reach the same amount of nutrient uh, digestibility and input. Animals that are reared on high quality diets have smaller rumens. Uh, some of our friends in Australia were looking at animals reared, exposed in utero to saltbrush, which is common on some of their landscapes there. And they were showing enhanced kidney function for animals exposed in utero to saltbush. I could go on and on and on, but it's simply to say that environments are influencing gene expression, which is influencing form, function, and behavior. So all of this then is what we were talking about, this and more actually, when we were working with ranchers like Ray Bannister. And they were thinking about how do we get rid of weeds without using herbicides? We don't want to use herbicides anymore. And they were figuring out that through managed grazing, we were working with them, cattle can learn to quote, mix the best with the rest rather than eat the best and leave the rest. There's a lot that I could say about this, but let me just try to give you some idea why that is. Animals learn patterns of behavior, Carl, as you were saying, and they learn how to mix diets. For instance, animals can learn that an appetizer of trefoil helps them to eat more of endophyte infected tall fescue. Why? The tannins in trefoil bind with the alkaloids in fescue. And so this is a learned behavior that mother can teach her offspring. Same sort of thing between shrubs like bitterbrush and sagebrush. I could go on and on with stories of this as well, but hopefully you get the point. So the French shepherds in France have turned this into an art form with their knowledge, learning from the animals and experimenting with the animals. And so it's mutual learning, the shepherds from the, their flocks of goats or sheep or cattle and vice versa but they use grazing circuits. So when they look across a landscape, they don't just look at what's the very best thing out here for our animals. They look at how can we use this so that we have appetizers, main courses, booster stages, desserts, and so forth. And that allows them to utilize the entire landscape, which stimulates appetite and intake of their animals. It allows them to target graze, to enhance and maintain biodiversity of plant and animal life on those landscapes. It also enables individuals, you talked about individuality, Carl, I could talk for long, long about the, the uniqueness of each individual as well as culture and the value of uh, choice enables individuality. So these shepherds then are basically ecological do doctors who are regenerating the health of landscapes. That's what people in the Western United States, some like Glenn Elzinga are picking up on and thinking about how to use that to nurture health, 
from soil and plants to herbivores and humans with a very heavy accent on carbon, fixing carbon and climate related issues. Uh, Glenn learned about this from the book that we wrote, The Art and Science of Shepherding. Um, Bob Budd did amazing work when he was managing Red Canyon Ranch for, for the Nature Conservancy. And very quickly, what he did was rather than fence and, and try to use techniques like that, they decided we're gonna change the culture of the cows from bottom dwellers into animals that utilize the uplands. And so he hired a rider and over a three year period, they uh, moved animals that, that lived in the bottom, moved them to the uplands. So they're retraining animals that, that would not stay out of the bottoms, they, they sold, they culled. And so they were able to change the culture of the herd. And after three years, the rider had worked his way out of a job. Why? Because now the calves are learning from their mothers. Uh, typically in these examples I'm talking about, there's a three year learning curve that's involved in this. So very quickly now, a couple of other examples for you. Um, rejuvenating sagebrush step, Aldo Leopold said the ax, the cow and the plow de destroyed landscapes, they can build them up. And we took his advice and worked with sheep and cattle to uh, enhance biodiversity of landscapes. Um, rather than using very costly and environmentally damaging mechanical and chemical means, we thought let's use sheep and cattle to rejuvenate landscapes. Uh, we did that on sagebrush steppe across a five state region. And basically we weren't trying to get rid of sagebrush. We were simply trying to reduce its abundance and increase the, the diversity of other kinds of grasses and forbs and shrubs in the community. And we had very great success doing that. There's a lot of nuance that went into how we did that. That's gonna have to leave for another time. But we were thinking about many creatures, including sage grouse, which are endangered, and ways to graze animals in patches that created habitat diversity. And we showed through studies that we were helping sagebrush populations with that. More generally, the idea was that different, um, different species have different needs, not only um, across species, but within the year, what different species need. And so our goal was to integrate livestock into the system, not use them simply as a quote treatment to create mosaics of habitat to meet needs within and among different, different species. Um, we were, we were also looking at creating locally adapted cattle as a part of this cattle that could utilize more sagebrush as we did with A.G. Smith on the Cottonwood Ranch. Uh, ranchers picked up on this and what they found was that a species they thought was, was simply horrible, sagebrush came to be viewed economically as very important as a winter, as a source of winter forage. The last example I'll give you here has to do with wildlife culture. And we did this at Deseret Land and Livestock, working with wildlife biologist Rick Danver and many other folks. Uh, Deseret began feeding elk in 1984. They were benefiting greatly economically from harvesting elk, but the neighbors were paying the bills. And so Deseret started to feed elk so that the neighbors wouldn't have to winter them. They decided that that was too expensive. And so 20 year, after 20 years, we worked with them to change the, the, the culture of the herd. We did that by using carrots and sticks and uh, <clears throat> some of the carrots. Areas grazed by cattle early in the summer are quite attractive to elk in fall and winter due to combination of regrowth and mature forage. So we were strategically grazing with cattle in areas we wanted elk to winter. Uh, we quit feeding then when the program finally went into place to encourage elk not to use traditional feed grounds. Elk were hunted in areas where they were previously fed to encourage them not to go to those areas. We used stockmanship, as fun as this may seem, to move and place elk in the desired locations. We also used a bit of supplemental energy and protein, not in the form of hay, that enables elk to utilize more sagebrush. So, since the project was initiated in 2000 and Ferrer, elk have been fed only in 2005 and 2000 and fed, uh, 2010. They are fed occasionally in areas where they want elk to, to be. So coming back to, to that food for thought that I started with. Um, so what was the secret of the, the bison hunter's success? Frank Meyer says, at the head of each of these little herds was its leader, but the leader wasn't a courageous old bull ready and willing to whip the universe. It wasn't a bull at all. It was a cow, 
a sagacious old cow who by the power of her intellect had made herself a leader. Buffalo society, you see, was a matriarchy and the cow was queen. Wherever she went, the others went as well. When she stampeded, they stampeded. When she got into trouble, they didn't know what to do. Our job as runners was to get her in trouble as soon as we could, the rest was easy. So what they did then, deliberately was to wound to wound the matriarch. They identified the matriarch in each group each day. They'd wound the matriarch. Her, she was the, the center of the, the sort of social, uh, emotional, geographic center of the group. They would not leave her, and so they would shoot the rest of the animals. Now, I know, Bob, I'm out of time. I don't know if you want me to show this video or not related to and uh, narrate briefly uh, in Yellowstone, T tell me your preference. You're muted, Bob. Okay, I'm going to show it then. I, so what we have here is is a huge group of bison, seemingly in Yellowstone National Park, along the Yellowstone River in Hayden Valley, and we we spent the day there watching what seemed to be one who. What it was is a group of, of many, many families. And so what you're seeing here as these bison are moving is simply families of, of Notice where, where the mom and the and the aunt and so forth are positioned around this small cap attempting to navigate the Yellowstone River here. Fred, I wonder if we could maybe we should maybe cut this one short then. Okay, so there's a calf learning to be a calf in Yellowstone National Park. So I'll conclude very quickly, Bob, by saying that livestock live in extended families when calves, lambs, and kids aren't weaned. That's what Henry was doing. Those little groups were extended families that were on his landscape. Um, as Carl said, this occurs in many, many different species around the globe. Um, That's gorgeous. That's really quite an image to keep in our minds at the end of this. And my question is, what price do we pay when we ignore transgenerational linkages to social and biophysical environments? We stress genetics as a mechanism of evolution, not appreciating that genes dialogue continually with social and biophysical environments to create <laughs> cultures. Animals aren't machines, genes aren't destiny. Animals are involved in the world, which helps them to evolve in the world. Thank you very much for the chance to be here with you guys. Sorry for going over just- No, that's not, not your doing at all. Fred, this is really precious stuff that people are commenting on the, in the chat about how wonderful that last image is. I wonder if we could keep our comments short for this in this exchange. Tanya, you got any thoughts about, um, about what Fred has shown? Yeah, I love that Fred brought up the idea of looking at how we begin our lives before we're even born. We do focus a lot on human pregnancies 
but you don't hear a lot about other species and what happens when they're in the womb. So thank you, Fred. This is such a great perspective that, um, as Bob said early in the beginning, we really don't talk a lot about. So yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Okay. Carl, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I would love to um, see Fred do a PowerPoint presentation that lasted for about a week. And I'd, <laughs> I'd love to hear all of those individual stories. And then I would love uh, for him and I to write about six books together about all of this stuff. That was absolutely super. And, and I, I felt um, very humbled by the extreme immersion into that work that you have done for all these years. So um, I was really riveted by that. Well, thank you, Carl and Tina both. That means a great deal to me. I, uh, we're very much on the same page, Carl. I, there's no question in my mind. It would be fun to, I do teach, I teach many, many classes actually. And it's as you, you just kind of, hitting the tip of the iceberg with, with, with 20 minutes. But as you know, and the work you've done, the more you get into it, the more amazing it, it is in all these senses, both physically, spiritually, the linkages, it's, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, I'm getting at a loss for it, ways to try to express br briefly, but yeah. It, Look, thank you both. Um, I'm, I'm still typing notes on, on your talk. I was taking notes throughout. So uh, thank you. That was, that was really, really excellent. Um, let me just note here, everybody, that in, um, we, there are sources that could be had here. Uh, and the links, um, links to these things will be put in uh, the chat. Don't forget that a lot of the material that's available uh, created by both our last two speakers can be available on their websites and um, further studies that uh, Fred and Carl have made are, are available there. Let me move on to Tanya um, and uh, Tanya is the social media manager for biodiversity for a livable climate. She earned a master's degree, a master's of science in animals and public policy from Tufts University where her academic research focused on wildlife conservation efforts and the impacts of human activities on wild habitats. She's designed digital campaigns urging the United Nations to include extensively bio, extensive biodiversity measures in their 2030 agenda for sustainable development. She's also an open water diver and photographer which she has used in her work as a writer on climate justice. Tanya, welcome. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. And thank you, Carl and Fred, for your wonderful presentations. I think this will complement everything that we've talked about so far. So let's get into it. So Bob introduced me, so I'm going to skip this slide. But yes, my name is Tanya Roa again, and it's nice for all of you to join us today. So I'll be focusing today on keystone species, and then I'll get into United States animal-related policy. And at the end of this talk, I will have some action items that we can all do just to implement what we've learned today. So first, I'll define what keystone species is. Keystone species really exemplify how animals impact the ecosystems because their roles are so crucial that without them, the ecosystem itself could collapse or it would look dramatically different than what we see it today. And I'm going to exemplify this through three different species. I'll be discussing prairie dogs, beavers, and sharks. So first let's start off with prairie dogs. Prairie dogs are ecosystem engineers and this means that they quite literally builds the world around them. And this benefits so many species that rely on this ecosystem. They live in grasslands and they eat the grass, but the way that they eat the grass actually promotes regrowth of this grass. It also allows for more space for other plants, such as flowering plants and weedy plants that other animals love, such as insects and pollinators and birds. They also do a lot of digging. They live underground. It's where they raise their young. It's where they hide from predators and other dangers such as flash floods. 
And so through this digging, they actually maintain soil health because soil relies on this process of decaying and rebirth. And so when you mix the nutrients together, you're actually encouraging those networks that the microorganisms such as microbes and bacteria have. And this maintains long-term health of the grassland area. These tunnels are actually used by other species as well. We've seen burrowing owl, owls and rattlesnakes use these burrows once prairie dogs have abandoned them. So they create homes for a lot of other animals. Unfortunately, because of early settlers and our desire to expand into the American West, we started converting grasslands into cattle ranches. And we still see those impacts today. That has led to a 95% range, historical range loss of prairie dogs. And this means they cannot do this work as much anymore. The cattle ranchers also saw the prairie dogs as vermin, meaning that they saw them as pests. They believed that prairie dogs carry diseases and they saw them as competition for their cattle because they ate grass. And so they thought, well, they're probably eating the food source as the cattle, so my cattle can't eat as much. But we know that this isn't true because as I said, prairie dogs maintain the health of the grasslands. So unfortunately, because of this idea that prairie dogs are pests, we have had a lot of policy backed practices such as mass poisoning and recreational shooting, which has led to a decrease in numbers in prairie dogs. And that means a decrease in all those benefits that we talked about. This affects the entire ecosystem. Like I said, all those other species that rely on the health of the grassland. It even includes those cattle that rely on those grass, that graze that grass. They actually do need the prairie dogs to continue the health of the grassland. So this really isn't a solution for anyone because if we want long-term sustainable agricultural businesses, as Fred said, we need to get all of the big picture in mind, the wild and domestic animals. So a better solution that we know of today is to use vegetation barriers. Prairie dogs need to be able to see far and wide because they need to be able to see incoming danger. And so they naturally stay away from tall grasses. So when you plant tall grasses and line that around your property, prairie dogs will naturally stay away. And this actually also creates wildlife habitat. So it's a win-win-win situation for everyone. You protect your cattle ranch or your property, prairie dogs stay away and they get to stay alive and you create habitat for other animals. Now I'm going to discuss beavers. Beavers are also ecosystem engineers, but specifically they are watershed restorers. This just means that they create lands that provides for um, an abundance of water and allows for a way to store that water. So they do this by promoting soil health as well. And soil acts as a sponge. When all those microorganisms are working together, they maintain that process where the water just runs right underground and it stays there even during the dry months. And that is what we're lacking right now in the American West. I live in California. I'm very well aware of how our mismanaged water policies have led to the land that we see today. We actually don't live in deserts. They just look like this because we got rid of animals such as beavers. This, these dams also that the beavers build, as the one seen on the bottom, they're massive and complex and they need constant maintenance. So that's why beavers go back and forth into creating these dams. And these also spread water throughout land. Instead of just creating a one lane river as humans do, they actually expand the river by creating side channels, reconnecting those side channels. It's a very complex system and they work with the river to do that. Unfortunately, we also have some policies in the past that are affecting us today when it comes to beavers. For them, it started with fur trapping, with early settlers, and then as we began industrialization, we started logging and we're still doing that to this day, which means they are losing habitat or they are, their habitat that is existing is degraded. Another thing I want to mention is that the dams that they create, create these ponds and these ponds have benefits in and of themselves. They create year round water supply. As I mentioned in California and American West, we see these wildfires now, but we've seen these fires actually just pass right on over beaver habitat and it stays green, it stays wet, even when that fire has passed by because of just how much water is stored underground and above ground in these areas. So we need these animals to come back in order to revitalize that land and that soil and to maintain more of that water. This, 
These types of habitats also filter toxic materials, meaning that all the animals downstream, even humans, benefit from this because when the water goes through there and gets filtered, it flows downstream, becoming even cleaner. And this also traps sediments. These ponds create the perfect foundation for plant growth. And that means many animals benefit because animals that are looking for water or fish that are looking for nurseries come, and then those animals that eat the fish. So as we see, these ecosystems have a lot of interconnected um, processes going on and the different roles that the animals play work together. And keystone species really are the connecting role in that. So some solutions that we have used in the past to get rid of beavers because beavers can harm um, property, they can cause property damage. And this is because they need to cut down trees to create those dams. And those dams can also block our culverts, which are just our pipelines that get water from one area of the city to another. But instead of killing or relocating beavers, because when you relocate a beaver, you're just creating space for another beaver to come in. You can actually just install fences around trees that you don't want to get taken down. Of course, we want everyone to be safe. We don't want a tree to land on a house where people live. But once a fence is around a tree, beavers simply just go find another tree. And there are also fence-like structures for culverts. As you see in the bottom picture, it's not necessarily just a fence. It does need to be more complex and cared for because you are dealing with water and mud and and it's not just simply a yard. But as you can see in the picture, it's low maintenance, it's not expensive material, and there are plenty of experts that are teaching people around the world how to do these. So when you do this, you actually work with the beaver, and then the beaver can maintain in that area, and they can keep all those benefits from the ponds and dams in that area. So it's another win-win-win situation for everybody involved. So before I get into the shark section, I do want to take a pause and kind of give some context on what kind of animal, animal related policies we have in the US at the federal and state level, because then I will be getting into what kind of legislation is currently right now in the US Congress regarding sharks. So at the federal level, we categorize animals in four different ways, companion, farm, lab, and wild. It really is about their function that we see, how they function in this society, rather than the animals in and of themselves. And that determines what kind of legislation we pass. So for companion animals, one example we have is it's against a lot of cruelty. We see these animals as family, right? Dogs and cats, we call them our sons, our daughters, our brothers and sisters. We see them as part of us. And because of that, we have a lot of legislation that's geared towards anti-cruelty, anti-torture, such as the PACT Act that was passed in 2019. For farm animals, we really only see them as food. We're talking about cows, pigs. Um, unlike Fred, who said that they have a lot more going on than what we see, our legislation does not reflect that. And that is shown in the Humane Slaughter Act that really just talks about how we should kill them. And this requires that we stun the animals before they are slaughtered for meat. When we get to lab animals, we see them mostly as research, research subjects. And this is seen in the Animal Welfare Act. Although this act is, does require that the animals get food and water and shelter and space to roam, there are loopholes to this because if a research study doesn't allow for that to happen, then that's easily just an exception for that rule. So that's when we see that we really only view them as research subjects in that area. And when we get to wild animals, we do have um, strong protections. As Carl mentioned, the bald eagles did make a recovery based off of this act because it has strong protections. Once an animal, once a species is determined as endangered and they are um, considered to get protections from this act, it's, it's an all, all hands on deck situation. We have to protect their habitat. We need to make sure that there is research that goes into it to see what threats they have and to address those threats. And that's why animals are making recoveries off of this. But my interpretation of this act is that we are helping species on the brink of extinction, right? We aren't protecting them because we feel the need to protect them. We protect them only when it feels like, oh, if we don't, then we're going to lose them forever. And that could harm us, that can harm humans. And so my point in all of these examples is that although we do have protections in, in place and we do have laws pertaining to animals, 
we're really missing out on the sentience of the animals in all of these categories and all of these perspectives. And at the end of the day, these le this legislation still puts humans on top, which we need to change. When we get to the state level, it's not that different. Here's a map from Animal Legal Defense Fund and the key on the left, you can see that the states in green are top tier, meaning that they have the highest level of animal, animal protection laws in the country. When we get to yellow, it's a little bit less. And when we get to red, it's the least amount of animal protection laws in the country. What this map doesn't show you, but it does say on the website, is that a lot of these laws pertain to companion animals. Like I said, we see them as family. So state laws do concern themselves more with the dogs and the cats, guinea pigs, hamsters, anything like that. Um, wild animals are second. So we do have protection laws in place, but it varies so much state by state that an animal living in one state can have a lot of protection. And as soon as they cross that border, because animals don't know borders, right? Since these are arbitrary, they lose all of those protections. It just varies so widely and it just shows how much of a range we Americans have when it comes to looking at animals. And farm animals and lab animals are actually at the very bottom. We don't have very many laws in place at the state level that concern them. So although we do have federal laws in place, federal laws do have the limitations, um, such as you need to be under federal jurisdiction to apply. Private companies usually get the exception. You can, if you have a company that goes across state lines, then that is under federal jurisdiction, but that still leaves out a lot of animals that don't go under that jurisdiction, right? So we have a lot of laws in place, but they are a bit outdated and they aren't addressing all of the animals at once. So some animals do get more protection than others. And I wanted to give this context because like I said, we're going to go back to sharks now because we do have some shark legislation in place right now in Congress. Before I talk about that though, why are sharks so important? Well, all top predators are keystone species just because they maintain balance in the ecosystem by not only strengthening prey communities by eating weak or, or sick prey and sharks case fish, but also they prevent overgrazing of really critical ecosystems. And for sharks, they protect coral reefs and seagrass beds, which we need to maintain a diverse and abundant ocean. So that's why sharks are keystone species and that's why they are so important to the health of our ocean. Right now, we actually have some shark finning legislation, but to give you some context on that, in 2009, the federal government, US federal government passed the Shark Finning Prohibition Act and this banned shark finning practices in US waters. So we no longer allow this practice and shark finning is when you take a shark out of the ocean you cut the fins off and you throw the rest of the body back in the ocean. This means the shark can no longer swim. And so they're going to die eventually, either from losing so much blood or because they're easy prey at that point. Um, because of this, a lot of people spoke out, chefs, scientists, divers, animal welfare activists, just a range of different professions and different people. And this led to 12 states and three years territories banning the shark fin trade because we were still importing shark fins, even though we had passed a ban on that practice in US waters, we were still, that means we were still supporting shark finning in other places in international waters. But these bans prohibited, prohibited that in those areas. And there were two attempts at a federal ban. Unfortunately, those both died in Congress, which means that Congress, the House of Representatives gets elected every two years and if a bill doesn't get passed by both the House and the Senate before those two years end, then the bill eventually just, it, it gets forgotten because Congress just renews itself. And so these two attempts essentially didn't lead to anything. However, good news, we have a chance to change that now. So this is a part where I ask you if you want to get a screenshot of this slide, and I will put this link to the sample email later in the chat, but there is a bill right now in both the House and Senate that is asking for the ban of shark fin trade. And this would impact sharks all over the world because like I said, we are still importing shark fins and we do that for a variety of reasons for meat, for leather, for health supplements. 
but we don't need to do this anymore. There are other ways to get those those um, substances, those sources of food and of and of material. So, if you want to support this, please do. And the reason I wanted to bring this up as well is not only for the sharks, but also just to make a point that this is how we create change, right? Policy doesn't get thin air. It starts with public opinion and it starts with people speaking out. When you call and email your representative, they have to listen, they work for you. And that is how we create policy. That is how we create change in this world, in this country. And so whenever there is a bill in place, I always encourage friends and family to share as much as you can spread awareness because that is how we create the progress that we want to see. Leading into my last few notes, my last few general action items going forward from this conference, as Carl and Fred already touched on, we are not only damaging this planet, but we are hurting other species. And that is because we see them as less than us, right? Or else why else would we harm them so much? And so there are a few ways that we can reverse that trajectory. One is adopt regenerative agriculture methods, which Fred really touched on. And this just means getting away from industrial agricultural methods, which emphasize pesticides or the, destroy, the destruction of soil. We need that soil to keep it, to stay healthy if we want to grow nutritious food for humans. And so human health, wild animal health, and domestic animal health, and planet health all really go hand in hand. We also need to include nature in urban settings. As we saw with beavers, a lot of conflict comes when we see that animals are coming into our setting. Although of course, there's no such thing as that, right? We all share this planet. There's no such thing as separating us from a park. At the end of the day, all of these boundaries that we have made are very arbitrary. And so we need to welcome them back by either planting plants in your backyard or just speaking about animals differently. Um, a big reason why we harm animals as well is, as we saw with beavers and prairie dogs, they're seen as pests. As we see with sharks, they're seen as thoughtless machines, or they're described as something else that's scary. And this reputation does impact not only how we treat them, but also what kind of policies are put in place, because we're not going to prioritize politics about animals that we don't care for, that we don't speak highly of. And my last point is that we need to shift away in general from this idea that humans are on top of this pyramid, right? We are only one part of nature and we are very much a part of nature. So to say that we are apart from nature is simply untrue because we rely on nature so much for survival, for every air we breathe, for every, every bite we eat, every sip of water, it all relies on this and all relies on these keystone species because without them, we wouldn't have those ecosystems in place. So I really hope this all resonated with you. And lastly, this quote that I'll leave you with, those who protect the animals lead the way in protecting and saving humanity on, and earth because we are all interconnected. And so remembering this is how we make change and how we, how we restore our relationship with mother nature. Thank you again all for coming today. I've had such a great time so far and yeah, have a great rest of your day. Yes, well, look, thank you, Tanya. Um, anybody, um, uh, Carl or, or Fred, you, you got any thoughts you want to um, add here or questions for Tanya? I would say, Tanya, wonderful presentation. I appreciate it all. For the start talking about behavioral solutions to issues related to whether it's prairie dogs or beavers. I think that's so, so important to think in those ways. It makes me think about work we did with coyotes over in Deseret. When people shoot them indiscriminately, it leads to more depredation. If you have coyotes in place that aren't doing any depredation, the last thing you want to do is, is shoot them. You have a culture there that's, that's in sync with you. So very much appreciated that and the policy issues. The, the welfare issues related to, to domestic animals, I think is a, is a huge one and to livestock and something that maybe in the question and answer we could get into, but feedlots violate all of the, the five freedoms of animal welfare basically and uh, regenerative ag and thinking about the importance of plant diversity to the health of animals, to the health of people who eat animal products is a huge, huge issue that links consumers directly with 
these kind of processes that we're talking about that stimulate ecosystem health. So thank you. Carl, I, I, I want to um, sort of amplify uh, Tanya's idea that the, the boundaries, you know, the park boundaries are very artificial. Uh, I often notice people say that they're going to go into nature, you know, like nature is in a park somewhere, the way that um, cornflakes are in the cereal aisle. And people have to understand that we're, we're on a living planet where these borders are, are artificial and must be more permeable because there, there is no hope for animals in parks. They, we, we have to accommodate the coexistence of living things to the greatest extent that is possible. I also, I would like to ask Fred, who just mentioned shooting coyotes, um, what, are, what are some of the implications with wolves in regard to all, all of this stuff, what you were talking about and what Tanya was talking about and people's responses to wolves? You know, it depends on the, the on the individual, Carl gets very much as we were talking individualistic, um, as you might expect some of some of the, the wildlife folks actually that I know, hunters and, and that, uh, and some of the ranchers don't like wolves, but then I can think of other ones. I uh, mentioned briefly Glenn Elzinga who uses shepherding practices and through those practices and the work that he's done has been able to very much accommodate wolves in the environment. So again, it gets very local as you were emphasizing, you know, the chipmunk in this, this place is not the same as the chipmunk just down the road, the same for, for, um, for the way people are responding to and then able to work with. Uh, to me, I think that's so critical. And Tanya, you made you know, behavioral solutions, thinking about being involved with these environments and how through our behavior uh, can we create solutions that, that, that uh, engender diverse species of life from plants and animals on the planet. Um, there's so much possibility. So how do we get that kind of, how do we get that kind of uh, Thing happening with people around land. That's what I've devoted the years to. You know, how do you work with with people to get them to think about that and think about what's possible and how we can do that? Well, you know, one of the one of the themes that I've been hearing coming through all three of you keeps coming back to the intersection of wild and domestic, um, and how we want as humans society to kind of keep them separate and be able to control them separately. Um, Here's the specific policy problem, is the competition, for example, between on the one hand, the farmer, and the other hand, the wildlife protector. There's the hunters, there, um, there's the environmentalists. And this conversation is a very difficult one in some areas, if I'm correct. Um, but it has to do with um, understanding in what ways some of these, these signal species like beavers, wolves, prairie dogs, coyotes, how, much they impact the ecosystem around them. And the question is, how do you as a farmer offering your farm in a particular way respond to them? And how does, how do, uh, that puts them over and against, for example, conservationists. Um, so this is, this seems to be a clashing of heads that I, I'm wondering if you guys could address here uh, because it's, it becomes the political football that gets pushed around. Uh, it's so true what you're saying, Bob, but I'll, I'll add a couple of thoughts. There's a group up here called Western Landowners Alliance, and they sponsored a workshop a year or so ago that was specifically related to your question, Carl, on large predators, wolves, grizzly bears, and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and how do you ranch successfully in those environments? The beauty of those kind of groups is they bring people from all different backgrounds together. There were people, wildlife folks there, um, ranching folks, uh, conservationists across the spectrum to have the conversation. And, and so much of it gets down to, in my mind, behavior-based solutions. There was a lady there who just does fabulous 
they ride. They, they ride like I was talking about Bud does. They have no problems with wolves or with, with grizzly bears. So, um, you know, it, it's very contentious. And in this greater Yellowstone ecosystem where we are, boy, if you want to get into a fight, just, just start talking about it with the wrong, wrong people. But what I think is the beauty of groups that come together and try to, to talk about solutions to so it becomes win-win. And I see some of that, which is encouraging. That's what I'm saying. It is really encouraging to see those kind of groups and activities taking place out here. Well, listen, we can now move into more broad questions. If any of you uh, have not already done so, please put some questions in the chat that, that we can field to, to our speakers. Um, uh, I wanted to bring up one question which um, uh, raises the issue of, of the larger impact of, of wildlife and domestic animal life and their management in relationship to the soil restoration and habitat restoration that is important for climate cooling. You know, it's the, the formula of how soil absorbs water, how transpiration happens, and how animals interact with that and that contribute to it is also a key to cooling the planet. And I was wondering whether any of you uh, wanted to, to comment on that. No, yeah, that definitely goes in line with what I was saying that, especially in California, we are feeling the need to cool the planet right now. And we have this idea that there are um, that the degraded lands that we live in are deserts, and it's simply not true. This this was prairies, and there were forests, and it was abundant before. And we will never get back to that, of course not. But we can get back to something that resembles that at least. And there are plenty of people, environmental defenders, indigenous peoples, who know that and who have known that for long. And those places where they manage that land is very, a lot cooler than where I live, right? In an urban area. So all these ecosystem functions, all these keystone species that are doing all this work, it does benefit not only the other species, other animals, but us as well and the planet. So I completely agree. It's a whole, it's all these processes that are working together to create this big process that cools the planet. I would chip in on that too, Bob, and as you, you and the folks you work with know and promote so well that this uh, regenerative movement, regenerative agricultural movement, I think there's a lot of um, importance to that and their accent on soil and on plant diversity and on soils to fix carbon. I think that's that's so worth worthwhile. I, I often think that, um, <clears throat> Plants, plants turn dirt into soil and diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, grocery stores and pharmacies for creatures below and above ground. And a lot of those creatures below ground as we're learning are important in fixing carbon as well. And so I think that movement becomes, it's, it's, it's a good movement. I think it's, it's really agriculture waking up to ecology where ecology has been for the last 50 years in many ways. Definitely. I do think there's this idea that we can do that in areas that are considered wild, but there is a movement that is bringing that into urban settings. Um, us at Bio for Climate are planting our first Milwaukee forest next Saturday, the 25th. Yes, next Saturday. And that is just a mini forest that is built for urban settings. And so these types of ideas, these types of um, creative ways of bringing plant life back into cities where we really do need to cool down a lot more because of the pavement and other things that are absorbing heat so much. Um, just like Fred said, it is this idea of going back to ecology, what we knew already before, but what we maybe lost sight of along the way. Tanya, I, I'm talking too much, but it just so resonates with me, all of these things. When I give talks, I virtually always talk about what, 
our use of resources, whether it's from fossil fuels to water to you name it out here in the West, to grow lawns, to grow monoculture grass lawns. And that one place to start is just think about what are the native plant species that would grow in your environment. And they're beautiful. Here where we live in Innes, we've let our place virtually go all to native grasses, forbs, and shrubs. And you come and we bring the neighbors over and they'll look and some are just totally monoculture, herbicide, pesticide fixated. But you show them seasonally all these different beautiful plants that are coming and going. And then you look at the different animal species that are able to inhabit that. And then you talk about, we're not using herbicides, we're not using fertilizers, we're not using pesticides, and we're not, we're not using water, the huge amount of water. And boy, is that an issue out West now as everything's drying up. Thinking about how do we get people to think about what were the native species that occurred here? And they're beautiful, but it takes a whole transformation of consciousness to see um, blue grandma and western wheatgrass and blah, 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 something that's, that's beautiful, as opposed to a monoculture of blue bunch wheat or of, or of grass, of lawn grass that doesn't have one wheat in it, you know? I, I think. That's a huge transformation of consciousness that would be worthwhile across the country to start thinking about that. And then what are all the insects, pollinators, birds, on and on and on that have habitat when you move away from one species to a really diverse mix of species in your yard. And you can plant herbal, vegetable, medicinal gardens for yourself and so forth. <laughs> Moves away from that whole monoculture control nature idea to diversity and the value of diversity for us and other creatures. Thank you. Um, you know, I, there's a question here um, that actually I think, Carl, you were the one that uh, mentioned this in passing. Um, and I remember nodding my head as you said, it. and this is basically the question of the whole question of economic functioning as being the biggest obstacle to solutions here. Uh, in other words, the economic piece of this, the notion that, oh, we can't go there because that would hurt the economy. You have any thoughts on that yeah i just typed an answer to that in the chat actually oh. it's to me it's the values that drive the way that we function economically you know like for instance um we privatize profits but we um we socialize all the pollution and all the uh health um problems and the environmental degradation. None of, none of those are folded into the pricing or the cost to the, the people who do it. So if they were, I, I don't think I, I don't think any particular kind of economy is a problem. I think that every every economy or every institution delivers on the values that are held by the people who drive it. Um, you know, there's everybody is um, very critical of capitalism, um, but communism and um, the kinds of socialism that were practiced in the USSR and uh, Eastern Europe were equally damaging to the environment as capitalism was because the values behind them were basically the same. And those values were that the world does not matter. The only thing that matters is what we are producing for people with a very, very short sighted view of, of that question. So, I, you know, I think you could have capitalism functioning perfectly well for people and for nature if it decided it wanted to do that, because it's all about what you decide to price and how you decide to price it. Mm, that's, that's, you know, in, again, Coming back to the, uh, we have a question here about that comes back to the question of the intersection of, you know, farmers and wildlife. Um, you know, what do you see as the leverage points for extending protections to animals that have been labeled as pests? You know, for example, wolves, or uh, does this have to be approached state by state, or are there any openings for a federal level that you, that you, any of you see? Well, wolves are interesting because they have been protected by the Endangered Species Act in the past, but they keep losing that protection. 
not because of science, we still see that wolves are endangered, but because of that conflict and big ag is just very influential in our government. It has been for a while. So I would say that we do have to stop relying on federal protections because if we just keep trying to get them protected, protected especially just under that one act, then we are, we're not going to um, have a long-term solution. It's just going to be based on whoever's president, whoever's in Congress, whoever feels that they should be protected. And states are hard. It's, it can vary, it, it can happen. And there are a lot of people lobbying governors right now. I believe it's in Idaho and Wyoming, if I'm not wrong, that they're allowing right now that people can kill wolves, even in dens. So even puppies, um, wolf pups. And obviously those don't pose any harm to the, they can't hunt yet. So this is not even a conflict at this point. It really is just how we view them. And the way I see it is we have to start small. I would start with state because what happens too is what happens in one state does, other states do see that. And it does impact how we, how we view um, policies, even if we're not in that state. Well, they need a wider constituency, and without that, it won't it won't work at any political level. One of I think one of the main problems with people on the on the land and um, many conservationists is that we're we we are literally from different regions and different cultures. We don't have the kinds of interactions that, for instance, Fred has spent uh, most of his life trying to um, uh, cultivate. But where people do that, it can be a lot more effective. Uh, otherwise, it all turns into a fight and then the fight turns into resentments and then resentments get passed along without anybody actually knowing who is saying what. Um, I, I've been involved in some environmental issues where um, people on one side, you know, simply hate me and they hate the people I've worked with without ever knowing anything that we have to say, because their friends have told them that I'm the enemy. And that's as far as they need to know. Not, you know, they don't need to know the, any of the nuances of any of the positions we actually hold or, or any of the things that we would want to work together on. So it gets polarized, and then and then you know once you're once you're polarized, the different poles are in their own echo chambers. We you know we have that as a national crisis basically right now, and it operates in, in a whole slew of issues, including nature and conservation. Yes, I mean, so true what you're saying, Carl. In my experience, that's you know, and I look back over the 50 years of working in natural resources at the university and with, with people on landscapes, it's just abs absolutely the case. I think of a class, an upper le level undergrad class that I used to teach with people from all vastly different backgrounds and ostensibly were great enemies of one another. And over the years I taught that, I came to see my role as a facilitator of a conversation and a conversation where we spoke from the heart, not from the, the polarities and the, the mentalistic kinds of things. And without going again into too much, it, it was amazing what would happen in that class, how when people were speaking from the heart, uh, whether it was an extreme conservationist or a rancher kid or whatever it was, and you set the context, how the kinds of conversations of valuable meaningful kinds of conversations we had about natural resources and their management. Um, it, it was just incredible and let you realize how much culture from when we're pups influences how we look at the world. And if you get a chance to be in a classroom like that, how it can open your lens, expand your, change your lens entirely. If you read reviews from that class, it was mind boggling to see how the students would, they, they couldn't even put into words how their views had changed listening to others from the heart level. That, to me, that's so, so critical and powerful. And then how do you do that in communities and so forth at local levels to get people not to be polarized, not black and white, but to listen and then 
create together, create, create meaningful kinds of ways forward to the challenges and opportunities we have to transcend the boundaries we create, basically, you know. Carl, I was wondering whether you, you might have been the target of the old epithet from the anti-conservation movement, which is you're a spotted owl person, right? But which means that you're mainly in favor of, of, of a bird over a human. Oh, you're a spotted you know, owl person. I'll, you're you're, you're preserving you. them. And you don't care about humans and their economics and their wildlife and their their life that they are making on this earth. You just care more about preserving a pretty bird. Uh, I'll tell you something funny about that example, and that is, I I think that the the use of the spotted owl to protect the ancient forests of the Pacific Northwest was um, maybe the biggest and stupidest strategic mistake ever made by the environmental community. Because what also depended on those forests were salmon that were worth a billion dollars a year. And the wood that they were cutting was worth a billion dollars a year. But after they cut it, it wasn't there anymore. The billion dollar salmon would always be there if they left the forest there. But the conservationists, my friends and colleagues were so out of touch with the nature of that place that they didn't know anything about salmon in those days, those days being the mid to late eighties. Hmm. Yes, this is, this is um, advice for us, right? That we, we know how to not simply argue for um, a, a a uh, cute and cuddly furry creature and how it's not fair to have them die unnecessarily, but actually to see how they fit into the habitat that we actually depend on, that they are a participant equally with us and that we actually depend on them. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, well, if you're asking me, I would say often, yes, certainly, but, but I think the, um... To me, the bigger lesson is know as much a, a, a about what you're talking about as you possibly can, and know as much about what your opponents are talking about as you possibly can. And then you'll probably come up with the best strategy that's somewhere out there. Any, uh, any final word? Ta Tanya, anything else you wanted to put in here? Well, Carl just said reminded me that we really need to think of conservation as a human problem. We think of it as an animal problem that we need to save this species, save this animal, right? But it's it's so much more than that. We are specifically for these forests and these salmon, the salmon actually bring nutrients from the ocean to these forests for those trees. And then there are people that live in those forests that depend on those trees. So you're not only harming the salmon or the owls, you're harming the people that live there as well. And that's why working with local communities is so powerful. And also it's, in my opinion, you can always get more from people who are living in this area. I know more about my home state of California than someone from the East Coast may be coming in. But if I went to the East Coast right now, I would be asking all of you in the East Coast, what is happening right now over here, right? You wanna ask people who live in that area, what the needs are, what they see that is happening, because that is the true knowledge right there, not research that comes from international people that just show up to a place and think they know. We really have to ask about the people that have been there for a while. Well, Fred, any, any final words? I sure agree with, with what you, you both just said. And that, that really was the idea behind BEHAVE is, understanding behavioral principles and processes for people at the local level. I guess I would say too uh, that we what we've all been saying we need to come to see that we're members of nature's communities. What we do to them ultimately we do to ourselves. Only by nurturing them can we nurture ourselves and I think we do that by declaring love not war on one another and uh, on the planet, all the creatures of the planet, basically. Well, look, with that, we may um, wrap it up. I want to do final reminders. If you look in the chat, you will see uh, some interesting 
um, links that have been put in there, including further information about the Miyawaki Forest Project. It's a global project toward urban, small urban forests. Um, it's uh, biodiversity for the liberal climate is already doing and working on in Cambridge and in Los Angeles. Um, the, there's also um, the, the, there's a questionnaire that's also in the, the chat there and we'd really love it if you could access it and give us some feedback. Um, the video for this talk will be available and be um, posted and you will find out about it as a registrant um, in about a week or two uh, and will remain up for other people to see. I want to make a last pitch that you put in your calendar November 20th again on a Saturday morning, 10 to 12, um, where will be the topic of discussion uh, in this series will be the COP26, the UN Climate Summit in uh, Glasgow, which will have just completed and it will be a chance to review it and to critique it among people who are very well informed on it. So I think that's gonna be a very important conversation in a very, as a response to a very important meeting at a crucial time. I wanna thank our speakers, Tanya, Carl, Fred, for your wonderful contributions. Um, and I think that we've, there's, this has been a real conversation about how, how animals help create ecosystems and how they interact. Um, and that I think that one of the takeaways is that we're part of that. Humans are animals. Thank you again. Thank you all. You. Thank you so much. Same for me. Thanks to all of you. Wonderful to be able to spend some time with you this morning. No kidding. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.